Hello and welcome back to the Quantum Information Reading Seminar. I hope this video finds you well. This week we're going to continue reading the paper that we've chosen for this course, namely Black Holes as Mirrors by Hayden and Preskill. We left off last week having read the introduction and having downloaded a bunch of citations. And the homework from last week was to take a look at each of the citations and write, write some notes about the, the, uh, each individual paper and how they are perhaps relevant for the paper under consideration. So I've gone ahead, as you can see, and I've done the homework after a fashion. So let me explain first what I've done here and the objective of the, and the reason why I did this. And then we'll move on to reading the next section of the paper. So as you can see, I've made, written here a brief review of the cited papers, the ones that we went through last week. And I've also written down some information about the context in which they were cited. So the first paper that was cited in our paper by Hayden and Preskill is the classic paper of Hawking, Breakdown of Predictability and Gravitational Collapse from 1976. Here's the, what I've done here is I've written in bold the context in which the paper was cited in the introduction. And also I've pulled out a sentence which I feel summarizes best the content of each paper in turn. So the context in which the Hawking paper was cited was the following. Hayden and Preskill wrote, is the information consumed by a black hole destroyed and lost forever? Question mark. And I've extracted this text from the abstract of the Hawking paper. The black hole creates particles in pairs, which with one particle always falling into the hole and the other possibly escaping to infinity. Because part of the information about the state of the system is lost down the hole, the final sub situation is represented by a density matrix rather than a pure quantum state. I feel like having looked through the paper that this is a relevant, um, this, this sentence captures perhaps the aspect of the Hawking paper, which Hayden and Preskill were trying to uh, refer to. The next paper that Hayden and Preskill refer to is The Microscopic Origin of the Bekenstein-Hawking Entropy by Strominger and Buffer, 1996. Here is the context in the introduction, uh, the context in which the paper was cited. Hayden and Preskill wrote, evidence from string theory suggests that the information, rather than being destroyed, can be encoded in the black hole's internal degrees of freedom and eventually transferred to the outgoing radiation. And the relevant sentence I feel from the Strominger and Buffer paper is the Bekenstein Hawking area entropy relation SBH equals A over 4, A is the area and S is the entropy, is derived for a class of five dimensional extremal black holes in string theory by counting the degeneracy of BPS soliton bound states. Okay, looking a little bit under the covers, the paper here of Strominger and Buffer provide a microscopic explanation for the entropy area relation of black holes. Also relevant to the, this discussion of uh, internal and external degrees of freedom of black holes is the paper cited uh, of Maldacena, Large and Limit of Superconformal Field Theories and Supergravity. This, of course, is the, the very famous ADS-CFT paper. Uh, the relevant, I think, one of the relevant sentences here that one can find in the Maldacena paper is that the large and limit of certain conformal field theories in various dimensions include in the Hilbert space sector a sector describing supergravity on the product of anti de Sitter space-time spheres and other compact manifolds. And again, reading a little bit further and with the benefit of a lot of hindsight, the reason why this paper may be relevant at this point in the Hayden and Preskill paper is that the Maldacena proposal gives a way to identify a Hilbert space for a black hole solution, namely by looking at this holographic jewel and uh, holographic jewel conformal field theory and looking at the states within this holographic jewel, it turns out that the holographic jewel conformal field theory that is meant to correspond to a black hole solution should have somehow a um, uh, inaccessible region and there should be somehow a thermal state associated to that. It's very interesting as we'll see. Further, in the introduction to the Hayden and Preskill paper, quantum information theory is uh, referred to and cited. Um, I didn't follow up that source by Bennett um, and et al. I mean, there are many, many really very excellent introductions now to quantum information theory. I just suggest you take your favorite and read that. Uh, the context in which the quantum information theory was first cited in the introduction to the Hayden Prisco paper, it, it reads, quantum information theory addresses quantitative questions about the acquisition, transmission, and processing of information in quantum systems. So that's really the, the sense in which quantum information theory is used in the Hayden and Prisco paper in the sense, this general coverall category of 
a theory of the acquisition, transmission, and processing of information, uh, particularly in the context of quantum systems. Now, a very specific result is referred to later on in the Hayden and Preskill introduction, namely the entanglement assisted classical capacity of noisy quantum channels, which is uh, to be found in a paper of Bennett et al. from 1999. The context of this particular citation is this sentence. This observation rests on known achievable rates for entanglement assisted quantum communication through a quantum erasure channel. And the sentence which I think best summarizes the Bennett paper is the following. We obtain exact expressions for the entanglement assisted capacity of depolarizing and erasure channels in D dimensions. So that's the main result of this Bennett paper from 1999. And it's the one certainly that will be used in the Hayden and Prisco paper. This exact expression for this uh, information carrying capacity of in particular erasure channels. That's apparently what we're going to be needing to know. As we go further in the introduction, we learn that black holes will be modeled by some dynamic process, in particular, the dynamical process that Hayden and Preskill will use is that of a highly randomizing quantum circuit to model the dynamics of a, internal dynamics of a black hole. And the paper, there are two sources cited here in this context, both uh, by Dunkett et al. The first is the thesis of Dunkett, efficient simulation of random quantum states and operators from 2005. The context with which, in which uh, Hayden and Preskill cite this Duncan thesis is this argument relies on a recent construction of efficient quantum circuits that realize approximate unitary two designs. We're going to learn about unitary two designs as we read through the Hayden and Preskill paper. Um, the, what does, the, the, here's a relevant sentence from the Duncan uh, source that, that presumably is uh, capturing what Hayden and Preskill want. We investigate the generation of quantum states and unitary operations that are random in certain respects. We show how to use such states to estimate the average fidelity, an important measure in the study of implementations of quantum algorithms. Also cited is a paper by Duncan et al. called Exact and Approximate Unitary Two Designs and Their Application to Fidelity Estimation. Here, I think are the most relevant sentence for the context of the Hayden and Fresco paper is, we develop the concept of unitary T design as a means of expressing operationally useful subsets of the stochastic properties of the uniform harm measure on the unitary group of, on n qubits. So we're gonna see that random quantum circuits will play an extraordinarily important role in the Hayden Fresco pr proposal. Finally, we move to the final citations of the introduction, namely uh, the papers of Susskind on the black hole complementarity the paper, the main paper referred to here is The Stretched Horizon and Black Hole Complementarity by Susskind et al, 1993. And the context of this citation is, uh, according to Hayden and Preskill, to these observers, a black hole is a seething cauldron of microscopic degrees of freedom localized close to the horizon, about one qubit per Planck unit of area, undergoing local unitary dynamics with a characteristic time scale of order the Planck time. Uh, Suskin et al, you can find the following sentence, which I think meets this uh, context here. We explain how these postulates may be implemented in a stretched horizon or membrane description of the black hole appropriate to a distant observer. And uh, there's a second citation by Suskin et al on black holes information and the string theory revolution also to this point. So that's essentially the homework done. You, the homework was to take a look at all the papers that were cited, read through them and find somehow a, a small summary in the form of say bullet points or even just one sentence um, in order that you can look back later on and have a record of what it is that uh, the authors of the paper under review, namely the Hayden Prescott paper, what they felt was important, the context of, of the citation and also, you know, uh, what aspects of these papers you may have also found interesting. So I did the bare minimum here. I hope that you had the chance to read through these papers a bit more in depth, perhaps skim them, uh, taking, uh, skimming them over a period of more than say a minute, and in fact, maybe over 10 minutes, and you could maybe you've identified some other points that may be relevant for the Hayden and Prescott paper, I don't know. So the important uh, part of this process here is that you start to develop this kind of overall picture of the literature, the surrounding and supporting literature for the paper you're reading, but not at this point to read all those papers in great depth. We may come to that, we may not. It depends on how we uh, go through the Hayden and Prescott paper. So today the objective is having looked at the general context and literature surrounding the Hayden and Prescott paper is to actually start reading the Hayden and Prescott paper. Now, as last week, and as with last week, I'm going to read through the Hayden and Prescott paper. I mean, by the end of these videos, I will have read aloud every single word of the Hayden and Prescott paper. And the objective today is to go through the section two. 
in roughly speaking, I'll uh, try and make a video for each section of the Hayden and Preskill paper. Then, then, without further ado, let's actually just start reading section two called A Classical Randomizer. And I'll make comments as I see fit as we go along. Black holes may not destroy information, but surely they hide it pretty well. How well? The black hole information puzzle really concerns the processing of quantum information, but let us begin our discussion by considering the fate of classical information that enters a black hole. So here we, the word quantum information, the words quantum information are particularly relevant. They italic to them, so they want to draw attention to this, this aspect of the paper. But they're going to talk about, in this section, instead classical information that enters a black hole. Now this is a very interesting device when writing a paper. You want to start with an analogy of your actual uh, approach, perhaps a classical analogy, one that's very easy to understand, that maybe isn't what you were going to do in the paper, but perhaps captures the essential physics of the, the ideas of your paper. It's really fascinating how often a classical analogy can pretty much summarize all the ideas behind a pretty intricate quantum construction. So I'm, um, uh, we've been made aware here that the, the section is about a classical an analogy, but we should also bear in mind that this classical analogy might actually capture all the salient physics of the uh, subsequent paper. So it's worth investing a little time to try and really understand this classical analogy. Suppose that Alice, a citizen of a highly advanced civilization in the distant future who has recorded her most private thoughts in a very confidential diary, has second thoughts and resolves to destroy her diary. How should she proceed? Bob, the top forensic scientist of Alice's era, has remarkable capabilities. He can recover the contents of an erased hard disk, restore the shredded pages of a document, even reconstitute burned pages from their ashes and smoke. Presumably, Alice's safest option is to toss her diary into a nearby large black hole. Eventually, the black hole will evaporate completely, encoding Alice's diary in the outgoing Hawking radiation, where it might be decrypted by Bob. But evaporation of a large black hole is an extremely slow process. Alice's secrets will, sh will be secure not for all eternity, but at least for many generations to come. Or will they? Since we are, for now, discussing only classical information, let us adopt a highly unrealistic classical model of a black hole. In brackets, it will be instructive to, in co to contrast this classical model with a quantum model of a black hole that we will discuss in section 3. In this classical model, Alice's diary is a bit string of length k, and the internal state of a large black hole is regarded as a bit string of length, a bit string of length n minus k, which is much bigger than k. So here already I find it often helpful to put in some kind of picture or illustration of these ideas. So in my, you know, here's our black hole, and here's Alice's diary, and I'm really pic picturing it as a bit string of k of length k, here we go, k bits. Now the black hole is comprised presumably of microscopic degrees of freedom. Sorry, I then left very hazily specified at this point, but at the very, very, very heart of a classical description, there must be some kind of information that can be encoded in these microscopic degrees of freedom. Hayden and Preskill take this approach and they presume that the black hole state the state of all the microscopic degrees of freedom, all the classical degrees of freedom of the black hole are also describable by a bit string. And how long is this bit string? N minus k bits. So we've got k bits from Alice's diary. Here's Alice's diary. We have N minus k bits describing a black hole. And we're meant to, to understand that N minus k is much bigger than k. So that the number of microstates available to the black hole is far larger than the number of microstates that encode the information for uh, Alice's diary. We assume that Bob, who has been observing the black hole since its formation has, and has a thorough understanding of black hole dynamics, knows the black hole's internal state, but he does not yet know the content of Alice's diary. Okay, the picture I'm going to draw for that. So this is, you know, let me number these pictures. Maybe we'll just sort of say, this is section two, picture A. Okay, now let's move to section two, what I'll call picture B. And we'll go back to the original source document here. And I'll just write in here that I'm going to draw a picture A. A meaning that uh, that's the referring to the picture I'm drawing. 
Um, and to B is the picture reference I'm going to draw for this next part. So here's 2A, the picture of the black hole and the bits. 2B, we come to um, Bob. Now, sort of the thing, the thing that I have in mind here is really a space-time diagram when I read this sentence. So here there's a sentence that's written. Uh, we assume that Bob, who has been observing the black hole since its formation and has a thorough understanding of black hole dynamics. So here's time going upwards, and here's space going to the right. And here at some point in the past, there was no black hole, then all of a sudden there is a black hole. And here's the black hole here in my very rudimentary space-time diagram. And also we have that stuff is radiating from this black hole. Now Bob is somewhere in the future light cone of this black hole. Otherwise he couldn't have observed it. So I'll draw Bob's light cone maybe in blue here. So somehow there's Bob up here. And uh, Bob is able to capture all the radiation that's coming off the black hole and has also observed everything that led up to the creation of the black hole. So this is somehow the cartoon that I have in mind for this sentence. So there's Bob. There's the radiation coming off from the black hole. He's observed the black hole uh, formation. It's in his past light cone. And, uh, well, you know, he can't capture all the radiation, but uh, he at least has observed everything that went, all the infalling matter that led to the creation of the black hole. Here's the infalling matter that came in from the past. He watched, he watched all that happen. He made observations. He's very, he has infinite, perhaps infinite or near infinite computational power and he's observed all of these dynamics in all the past history and he has a pretty good idea of what made up the black hole and how black holes work because he's completely solved gravity. That's the picture that I have in mind when reading the uh, this sentence here about Bob's understanding of black hole dynamics. Now Alice tosses in her diary, the black hole's bit string grows to length n. Okay, seems reasonably plausible. Uh, I'll draw the diary coming in in red, say, here comes the diary. There's my picture of the diary here. The diary gets thrown in. Now the number of microstates required to describe the black hole plus diary system presumably has to increase, right? Because the black hole had n minus k bits describing all of the state of all its microstates. We've added in k additional uh, bits. So we need to have some more microstates to describe that. So I think it's reasonable that the number of microstates describing the black hole plus diary system should go from at least uh, black hole plus diary uh, should have n minus k plus k bits required to describe the number of microstates that it has, assuming that things scale extensively. And why not? For the purposes of this analogy, we'll just believe this, these, these kind of assumptions. Now, Alice tosses in a diary, the black hole's bit string grows to length n, so that the black hole has gotten bigger, right? And Bob knows n minus k of these bits because he's watched all of the infalling matter and he knew all the states of all the infalling matter. And the black hole's internal dynamics process this length n string. We model this dynamics as a permutation known by Bob. So Bob is a fantastic physicist. He knows everything about black hole dynamics and he knows exactly how the black hole will process this diary as it falls into the black hole. So here is the number, here's the bit string describing the black hole and here's some extra bits describing the diary. So 011011, I don't know, whatever the, the bit string is. And the bits describing the diary I'll draw in red. And then the state of this classical system is a, is a string, is the state of a string of bits. What's the most general dynamics reversible here? Note that it's important that the dynamics is considered reversible. Reversibility is the classical analog of unitary. So this is the state of black hole plus diary as some state of n bits, right? N of them, that was the assumption, N bits. What's the most general dynamics that a classical system can undergo, general reversible dynamics? The answer is a permutation.
So the most general reversible dynamics of a classical system is a permutation of the states of this classical system. So let's do an example. You know, suppose our classical system is comprised of two bits, right? One bit for the black hole, one bit for the diary, if you like. There's four possible states for these two bits. And the system is to undergo a unitary or reversible, unitary makes sense here in this context. It's meant to undergo a reversible dynamics of the uh, classical states. And the most general dynamics works like this, right? You have the first state, 0, 0, has to get mapped to some state. So there's four possible outcomes here. The second state of the classical system under, under reversible dynamics has to go to uh, another state, but it cannot go to one zero, otherwise it wouldn't be reversible, there would have been many to one. So we only have now three possibilities. The third state has to get mapped, obviously, to some image state. Now there's only two possibilities, you can see where this is going. And the final state is fully determined by the first three, the dynam under the, uh, the action of the dynamics on the first three. How many um, kinds of dynamics are there? What's the number of reversible dynamics on a two bit system? Well, it's obviously four factorial, right? There's four places where the first state could get mapped to, three with the second and so on. Now, um, in general, for n qubits, Oh, n bits, sorry, you can see. Um, I'm uh, get used to qubits ever so quickly. There's two to the n possible states of n bits, and therefore there are two to the n factorial possible reversible dynamics for n bits. Why is it reversible? Well, every uh, it's um, injective and onto, one to one and onto. So now Alice tosses in a diary, the black hole's bit string grows to length n, where Bob knows n minus k of the bits, and the black hole's internal dynamics processes this length n string. We model this dynamics as a permutation. Yep, that's what we just did. Known by Bob. Bob knows the permutation. He's a great physicist. Of all the two n strings of length n, not a permutation of the n bits. Now this is important, right? In fact, let's go back to this example here. If the dynamics of the black hole was modeled as a permutation of the bits, there'd only be two possible dynamics, namely leave the two bits alone or swap the two bits. See the difference, right? You know, the number of reversible dynamics for two bits is actually four factorial, uh, but the number of permutations of two bits is just two of them, do nothing or swap them. So that's, uh, you can see that the, the number of reversible dynamics far exceeds the number of permutations of the bits. After the processing, the black hole releases the bits one at a time in the Hawking radiation as Bob watches expectantly. How soon will Bob be able to read the diary? We claim for that for almost any permutation, Bob will need to receive only a few more than k bits before he will be able to decipher the complete diary, with a low probability of error. Alice's secrets are not protected for the full lifetime of the black hole, rather they are revealed to Bob almost as quickly as possible. So this sounds pretty wacky, right? You know, the, the black holes uh, emitting these bits and uh, somehow within only a couple of units of time, already the black hole has, has, has leaked out this information from the diary. A fairly strong statement, right? So the black hole dynamics is deterministic, right? It's, uh, we've assumed that it's a permutation and it's a known permutation, so, and it's therefore reversible. And there's no randomness. I mean, if it wasn't deterministic, if it was a non-deterministic, if it was a Markov chain or something like that, then we'd have no hope. Let's just be clear. But we want to assume that black holes evolve unitarily or reversibly in the classical context. This is, uh, you, otherwise, you, you know, you might start to get worried about the conservation of probability, or it may not be an issue. But for analyzing the, inf uh, one particular known permutation is applied to the n-bit string. 
But for analyzing the information content of the radiation, it is helpful to adopt the information theorist's favorite trick to assume that the permutation has been chosen uniformly at random from among the two to the n factorial possible permutations, possible reversible dynamics. Now, this is a fantastic trick, this favorite trick. And you'll see the, the this, these ideas date back to at least Wigner. Um, so the favorite trick uh, in the modeling of large complex uh, molecules and large complex atoms. So the, the spectra of a large complex uh, molecule or atom is very difficult to understand. Right? There's lots of levels as you go up in energy and they look pretty randomly spaced. And this idea of, of Wigner and certainly of other authors, Wigner is the one that comes to my mind first, is that, okay, let's assume that a complex system, a large complex system with many, many, many subsystems isn't, it is in general position, right? All the little degrees of freedom, they, they are somehow in general position with respect to each other. I mean, otherwise there'd be some symmetry, right? Some amazing symmetry in the system. So let's suppose our symmetry doesn't really, a system doesn't really have any kind of symmetry. So the consequence of that simple assumption um, that there's no special symmetries uh, apart from the ones that are given by the laws of physics such as uh, time reversal symmetry and so on. So if there's no additional symmetries then all the degrees of freedom are somehow in general position with respect to each other and then the dynamics of all of these degrees of freedom should interact with each other more or less on the equal footing uh, and there are many, many such uh, possible Hamiltonians or dynamics you could attach to such a configuration, and they all ought to share some common features. And uh, what's to pick one over the other, right? You know, a slight perturbation would push one configuration of the particles in general position into another. What's to pick one over the other? Uh, if we have no additional information, we just make the hypothesis that uh, each, you know, each possible dynamics is as equally likely as another. You know, all things being equal, then we'll just chip pick one at random. Sort of the physical intuition behind all of this. And uh, so it's the information theory's favorite trick, but it's also the physicist's favorite trick. It's uh, if you don't know anything more than the observed symmetries or lack thereof of a, of a system, then just pick a model at random and see how well that does. And yeah, surprisingly, a lot of things get uh, are well modeled by random dynamics. For example, uh, the statistics of the energy level spacings do tend to match random th those of the eigenvalues of random matrices. Rather fascinating thing that will take us a little bit far away from the current paper. Anyway, so we're going to exploit this information theory's favorite trick. We assume that the microstates or microscopic degrees of freedom of a black hole are somehow in general position with respect to each other. They interact on an even footing with each other. And which interaction pattern are they following? Well, let's just choose one at random. After processing by the black hole, Alice's k-bit message has been transformed into one of two to the k possible n-bit strings. Okay, that's important, right? Uh, here's the black hole plus Alice bit string there's Alice's here's the black holes bit strings and then some permutate some crazy permutation the random dynamics of the black hole act on it you know I've drawn it like it's permuting the bits but you shouldn't really think that when you see this it's really permuting the states and then uh, what do they say they say uh, after processing by the black hole, Alice's k bit message has been transformed to one of two to the k possible n bit strings. And if Bob could read all the n bits, he would know which of the two k strings he had and so decide decode Alice's message. Ah, okay, right. So the story is here there's two to the k possible diaries. Right, there's k bits describing Alice's diary. How many possible diaries could she have written? Well, in theory, in she could have written an arbitrary bit string. So there's one of two to the k possible diaries. The permutation that's applied to the, the black hole plus diary system, so there's some weird permutation applied by the black hole, I call it pi, uh, processes the, the diary bit string, but it would also in principle process any diary of k bits into a new bit string. 
And well, how many possible bit strings are there? So that the black hole is modeled by a bit string X, the diary is matched, modeled by a bit string K, and pi acts on this sort of concatenation of these two bit strings, which I'll just draw as X, K next to each other concatenation. And how many are there? Well, there's two to the K possible such bit strings, and we'll call this output bit string Z. And there's, uh, so there's two to the K possible strings, depending on the two to the K possible diaries. And these are uh, states of n bits, right? The n bits modeling the black hole. And if Bob could read all n bits, he would know which of the two k strings he had, and so to decode Alice's message. Super, right? We can that 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 sh that should I hope be clear. Bob, what does Bob know? I'm going to highlight here what Bob knows. So Bob knows pi, right? He he's fantastic. He knows everything about the dynamics of black holes. He also knows x, but he doesn't know k, right? So since he knows uh, x, uh, pi and x, and he knows also, of course, if he waited long enough, he could uh, also know the output, state of the output, or the, the state of the black hole straight after the uh, black hole, uh, the diary was absorbed. So Bob could take pi, which he knows, invert it. He knows the inverse. He knows Z, and therefore he gets X and then K, and then he just drops off X and then he has the diary state. Okay, that all makes sense so far. Um, but even if Bob has access to just a few more than the first K bits of the string, he is likely to be able to rule out all messages except the correct one so that he can still decode successfully. Okay, that sounds like a wild statement right now, right? Uh, like that this sounds information theoretically ridiculous at this stage, right? I'll just put a couple of exclamation marks there to indicate that I'm suspending disbelief. For the case of a random encoding, the probability of decoding failure is easily estimated. If Bob, Bob reads the first S bits of the string, what is the probability that these bits accidentally match the first S bits of an encoded message other than the correct one? Okay, good, good question. So here's my, here's the bit string. This is a black hole after the permutation. This is Z, right? This is the state. Now, what if Bob only reads S of these bits here? We'll draw this in green. S. So S is much less than than N. He reads he reads these first S bits here. And Hayden and Prescott go on to ask, what's the probability that these bits accidentally match the first S bits of an encoded message other than the correct one? You know, what's the probability that there's a, a, a totally different diary entry, uh, entry would accidentally match this. Well, we can estimate this probability with a simple counting argument. For each message, the probability of an accidental match is two to the minus s, right? There's two to the s possible states of the s bits that Bob looks at. And the probability that one of these strings accidentally matches the one that we're on, assuming that everything is equally distributed, it must be two to the minus S if everything's uniformly distributed. Okay, that's mine, I guess. I guess I agree. And since there are altogether two to the K encoded messages, the probability P fail that any of the wrong messages matches the S bits satisfies the following inequality. So the probability of a failure um, is got to be less than, well, the total number of diary entries times by the probability of a collision, which is two to the minus C, where S is K plus C. All right, there are two to the K encoded messages and P fail must mean here that Bob fails to decode, right? Yes, okay, so the Bob wants the probability of failure, right? You know, so the worst case scenario is that all two to the K diaries collide on the same S bit string. That happens with probability two to the minus S times by the number of possible diary diaries two to the K, and then we end up with this two to the minus C, and the C is just 
is k minus s, right? So this is as an equation missing in here, two to the k minus c, right? Uh, to the k minus s. Therefore, if Bob wants the probability of failure to be no larger than two to the minus c for some constant c, he decodes after receiving k plus c bits of Hawking radiation. Okay. The probability of failure to be no larger than two to the minus c for some constant c. So two to the minus c goes down pretty rapidly as c gets bigger, right? Two to the minus one is a half, two to the minus two is a quarter. And so if you want the probability of failure being smaller than two to the minus, 10 to the minus 36 or some crazy number like that, then c need only be something like 30 or 40. Uh, so therefore, if Bob wants the probability of failure to be no larger than two to the minus c for some constant c, he decodes after receiving k plus c bits of Hawking radiation. So he, he adds this kind of buffer he receives a couple more bits of Hawking radiation, namely C bits, and every additional bit of Hawking radiation that he captures drops the probability of a failure by a factor of a half. And so here we speak of the probability of a failure because we are averaging over all possible encodings of K bits into a block of N bits. Our conclusion is that most encodings work. So crazy as it seems, uh, if Alice drops a diary in and the diary has Go back up here to the picture. Alice drops in the diary. The diary is described by k bits, the black hole by n minus k, and the black hole's dynamics are chosen uniformly at random, so it's an arbitrary permutation. Then the state of the black hole straight after the dynamics, which we call z, we've been calling this the state of the black hole after the dynamics z, well, there's two to the k possible states of n bits, and they must be uniformly distributed uh, over the state of all possible n bits, because this pi was uniformly at random. The pi we chose, the dynamics of the black hole were uniformly at random. And so somehow the picture you should have in mind is, you know, here's the, the picture of all states of n bits. Right, this, is, this blob here is not a black hole. This is just a, a picture of state space. And all possible uh, diary plus black hole post dynamics states, they, they're somehow uniformly distributed around the space of n bits. And the probability that all of them somehow had the same first s bits is uh, because they're uniformly distributed around the state space should be bounded by uh, 2 to the k times by 2 to the minus s. And this is a picture I have in mind as I read through this. Now in information theory, the capacity c of a noisy channel is the maximum achievable asymptotic rate at which coded information can be sent through the channel with a negligible probability of a decoding error by the receiver. What we have just described is related to two standard results in the theory of noisy classical channels. Citation 10. Let's take a look at citation 10. Citation 10 is from Cover and Thomas, The Elements of Information Theory. Okay, this is a classic book on information theory. So I won't bother to look it up. I'll just hope that they describe the result in full. Number one, the classical erasure channel with erasure probability P has capacity C, one minus P, meaning that roughly one minus P bits get through. And two, random encodings achieve this capacity. In our setting, the black hole dynamics transforms Alice's K bit message into one of the two to the k code words of a random code with block length n, right? So pi, the permutation of the black hole dynamics, takes this n bit string, and there are two to the k possible n bit strings corresponding to the n minus k black hole microstate plus the two to the k possible diaries, and maps them all over state space into two to the k possible uh, code words, let's call them. We say that the rate of the code is r, given uh, equals k divided by n. The number of messages per bits per, uh, sorry, the number of message bits per bit in the code block. When k plus c of the bits in the block have been re revealed by Bob, the remaining n minus k minus c bits have in effect been erased. Okay, so this is the picture. Go back here, so Bob sees s bits, right? But that means he does not see n minus s bits. They've been effectively erased for Bob. So that's why the black hole 
It can be modeled by an erasure channel at the most naive way at this point. So S is equal to K plus C. I forgot. Yeah, S is equal to K plus C. Yeah. So this is, right, this is a funny way of writing it. N minus S. Bits have been in effect erased as far as Bob's concerned. Yet despite these erasures, Bob is able to decode Alice's message with good success probability. Letting N get large with R and C fixed, we conclude that the message can be decoded even as the fraction of erased bits. So N gets large, R and C fixed. We consider, conclude that the message can be decoded even as the fraction of erased bits approaches one minus R. That is the rate R equals one minus P achievable in the limit of a large code block. To Alice's dismay, we conclude that in this model, a black hole is hardly black at all. It might be accurately be regarded as a kind of information mirror. Alice throws in her diary into the black hole and it bounces right back. Granted, it may be a strange sort of mirror since if the Hawking radiation leaks out slowly and K is much, much bigger than one, then Alice's message is obscured for a while. Furthermore, Bob needs to use his knowledge of the black hole's initial state. That's crucial here, right? If Bob didn't really know the black hole's initial state, then he's just totally screwed. And it's dynamics to decipher the reflection. But once a few more than k qubits have been re-emitted by the black hole, the diary comes back into sharp focus and Alice's secrets are no longer concealed from Bob. What is especially ironic about this scenario is that by modeling the internal black hole dynamics as a random permutation, we hoped to maximize the black hole's power to hide the information it consumes, but at least as a matter of principle, we have achieved the opposite of what we intended. The random permutation encodes the k-bits in the form that is optimally protected against the damaging effects of erasure. Let's point out some simple implicit assumptions underlying this model. We have assumed that the internal dynamics of the black hole is very fast, right? It can do this crazy permutation in like one instant of time. The permutation is applied almost instantaneously after Ellis's message is deposited before any of the Hawking radiation leaks out. We will return to the issue of estimating the actual thermalization time scale in section four and five. We have assumed that the permutation is typical. This assumption is non-trivial because if the dynamics of the black hole is realized by a reversible classical computer performing local logic gates, then most permutations require very long computations and the computations can be performed efficiently, maybe far from typical. So note that efficient may mean far from typical. Similarly, we have not worried about the efficiency of Bob's decoding operation. Yeah, right, that's important. We've imagined that Bob consults a huge code book that lists the two to the K valid message strings, but if K is large, then this code book would be of man unmanageable size. We will discuss the efficiency of the recovery procedure further in section five. Finally, the most glaring drawback of our model is that it is classical. Let us turn now to the quantum generalization. Okay, so that's it for today. We've read section two and we've developed through reading a, a, at least a caricature of the systems and dynamics described in the paper. Next week, we will take a look at section three, a quantum randomizer. In this, the authors promise to develop a quantum analog of the model that we've just considered, the classical model with the uh, classical uh, random permutation modeling the dynamics of the black hole. Now, it's already possible at this stage to sort of imagine what, how these things will generalize. You know, bits will go to qubits, permutations will go to unitaries, um, Erasure presumably remains erasure. And as we sort of flip through here, we can see some of the similar sort of numbers that were mentioned in the, the classical section. There's N's and K's, and there's a picture of a space-time diagram and some radiation. So hopefully this classical analogy that we've just explored uh, will help us, will put us in a good position to understand the more demanding quantum description, but without losing the essential physics. But that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please stay healthy and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye bye.